Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Is it time to take those age-old words from Ronald Reagan and apply them to the most famous residence, or one of the most famous residences in Canada, 24 Sussex Drive? That's the argument made in a Toronto Sun op-ed by Aaron Woodrick, federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Time to tear down 24 Sussex. Aaron Woodrick joins me. Aaron, good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. So let's talk about this, because there is, with any sort of heritage property, this idea of, you know, an emotional attachment to it. And and I think that in the case of 24 Sussex, there's really nothing all that historic about the building itself, except for what it's been used for. But still, there's a lot of pushback on this idea that we should tear it down. So why do you think it has to go? Well, look, I mean, I wrote this speech. I'm a little bit tongue in cheek. I think that tearing it down is something that needs to be on the table. Um, We can look at other options, but the point really is we need to do something with this building. This building is falling apart. Um, The prime minister doesn't live in it. I don't blame him for not wanting to because it is is too hot in the winter or too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter. There isn't even air conditioning. I mean, there is faulty uh, wiring. The plumbing is bad. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, and taxpayers, though, still have to pay every year for upkeep of this building several hundred thousand dollars a year. So it's a waste of money. Um, we're kicking the can down the road. It's a classic, you know, don't want to deal with it. And the bill gets bigger later problem. So I just really think we need to get moving and tearing it down needs to be on the table because, look, I think you hit the nail on the head. People think that it's historically important, um, you know, because prime ministers have lived there. I don't think a lot of them realize uh, they've only lived there since the 1950s, for one. And also, architecturally, there's a strong case. There's really not that much special about the building. It's only special because of who's lived in it rather than the, the structure of the building itself. If anyone's familiar with Ottawa, they'll know what I'm talking about here. But I remember driving with a friend who had never been before down Sussex Drive. And I said, oh, we're about to see the prime minister's house. And I, you know, we, we round this bend on Sussex. And I say, you know, take a look over there. And they're like, wow, that's beautiful. And I said, no, 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 that's the French ambassador's house. It's the uh, <laughs> the tiny one next door. But but really, it, it's not even a standout building by Ottawa standards necessarily, let alone Canadian standards. And when I'm looking at uh, Justin Trudeau not living there, the reason for that was always that he was going to say, all right, everyone's been kicking the can down the road. Uh, We're going to do the renovations and I'm going to forgo my opportunity to live there. And that was long overdue, but it doesn't seem like any work is actually happening with him being elsewhere. No, you're right. And well, I guess you're not entirely true. He's already had the chance to live there, remember, when he was a kid. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. He is he is foregoing the chance now. But you're right. I mean, the, the main reason for not living there is to fix it up. But he's been quite candid in saying, look, no, uh, no, prime, no prime minister wants to be seen to be spending money on themselves. Boy, Andrew, I wish he took that attitude when it came to spending everything else. Uh, he's kind of got it backwards. He's not spending on something that is owned by Canadians. Remember, this is not his personal house. I mean, Canadian taxpayers own this house and will own it forever. Uh, So, you know, he's not really spending it on himself. And yet when it comes to anything else, he's happy to toss a billion, a million here, there. So I think he's got it backwards. I think he should be more careful on spending everything on everything else. And he shouldn't be so reluctant to spend money on what's essentially a government building. You know, if there was a downtown office building in Ottawa where government bureaucrats were working, no one would say, don't fix the roof if it's leaky. Um, And yet that's exactly what we have with 24 Sussex. Yeah, and what's interesting is that this is a distinctly Canadian problem in that if you look at the U.S. or Britain, for example, their official residences for the president and the prime minister are also the official working quarters of them. So 10 Downing Street is an executive office and home. The White House is an executive office and home. And if you have that, you don't have this problem that we have now. And I I, I don't know if it's possible to go back to that. I don't know if we can build an apartment in the old Langevin block and say, this is where you live now, or or consolidate the two to some new building we create. But if we say everything's on the table, you could build a working residence that is cheaper than the renovation costs that are being floated for 24 Sussex. You're absolutely right. And that does need to be on the table. So, I mean, whether we tear it down, um, maybe we rebuild there, maybe we rebuild some somewhere else. Maybe the prime minister keeps living at Rideau Cottage. I mean, it seems to be working as an arrangement that that could be some cost savings. Uh, maybe, you know, the opposition leader and the speaker of the house, they both get 
official residences. Maybe the prime minister takes one of those and then we give the speaker or opposition leader uh, a generous housing allowance like we do for other MPs. Or maybe we do, like you mentioned, uh, the US-UK model where you have both a working building and a residence together. We could put that somewhere else in Ottawa. So there's all kinds of options. Obviously, the sky can't be the limit for cost. I mean, we're still talking about significant money here. But the point is we have to do something because every year it's 300 grand down the toilet and we don't move the ball anywhere on this. So, I, you know, I really wrote this to try and get the conversation going uh, and, and just, you know, really make the point that doing nothing is, is not really an option anymore. There is the fiscal conservative in me that says, you know, they can just get a housing allowance like everyone else. But I, I do think from a, a symbolic perspective, there is an importance of having an official residence. I, I don't think that's unreasonable in the grand scheme of things. But when I look at the cost, and you say in your column here, at least $34 million, you could build something that looks identical or looks better and is functional and state-of-the-art for a fraction of that cost. And that's the part that I find so baffling here. And we see this with the center block renovations just down the road, uh, you know, going to be costing a billion dollars. I mean, you, you could just... How much? If we're lucky. Yeah, I mean, you could literally build something that looks identical for a fraction of the price. So why is that, that these reno costs are so much more than creating something that would be quite beautiful? Yeah, so uh, in the case of 24 Sussex, there's a couple reasons. One is, uh, and they are understandable when you think about them, one is security. So this is not a regular mansion, right? The security needs are very different for this than they would be for a regular house. So that adds quite a bit to the tap. The other thing is the location. It's on a beautiful cliff overlooking the Ottawa River. Um, you know, I have actually spoken with some people who said one of the fears is that cliff could literally just topple over and the whole house goes into the Ottawa River. So you have the structurally, there are a lot of big demands, but that's part of the reason I think maybe we rethink the, the location. It's a beautiful location, but maybe it's not the safest or the most cost effective location for the prime minister to live. So maybe we should look for somewhere else. Uh, but one other thing on the rebuild, you know, I think one thing that has not been talked about enough is the opportunity. Um, if, if you made this sort of a, think of it as a national contest, right? Open it up and, and let, uh, you know, prominent architects from around the world design something, something unique, something new. In this country, Andrew, we're, we're a pretty divided bunch a lot of the time. We don't have a lot of big symbols to rally around. You know, if you invited people to do that um, and you, you made a contest out of it, you could let Canadians participate in the process. I think you could also save some money because I think a lot of people would be willing to attach their names to this or donate, uh, you know, their time or, or work to this because it's something that's so special. So there might actually be a win-win here where you get something new and unique and actually save some money in the process too. You know, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Stornoway, which is the official residence of the official opposition leader, actually was paid for by private money. I can't remember the time, but it was bought, I think, by a conservative opposition at the time uh, because they said, oh, you know, we, we'd like to do this, but we don't think the taxpayer should, on, should be on the hook. And I, I think that you may be right there that there would be a, a public appetite to contribute to this if we view it as a, a private residence and I or, uh, sorry, as a publicly owned residence and, and not a private one. Although, you know, your thing about the coastal erosion, maybe that's the whole point here is that wait until it falls over and then we just get the insurance <laughs> payout. And that's, you know, because then no politician has to be the one to say it's time to do this. Yeah. And then all the more reason for nobody to be living in there. So, <laughs> yeah. So let's let's talk about that idea of it, though, because I do think that any prime minister is between a rock and a hard place. It's the same as salary increases. No politician ideally wants to vote themselves a salary increase that doesn't the stop them that doesn't stop them from doing it a lot of the time but but you know you and I would be jumping up and down on Trudeau if he were spending millions of dollars for his own gain so is there a way to completely depoliticize this process i know the national capital yeah. commission has some oversight uh, of sites in ottawa is there a way to take the politicians out of the equation and say this is going to be managed by someone so independent that no one can accuse us of you know stealing the taxpayers money for our own gain yeah i think what would definitely be helpful is if the ncc puts out proposals or options in advance of an election and there's buy-in beforehand right i think that's the key is you need multiple party buy-in and you need it before you know the outcome so mm -hmm. then you can't accuse people of saying well you're only spending the money because you get to live there if you know you had a reasonable proposal that had the you know buy-in of every major party and even groups like ours like if there was a i, I you know i'm not saying we are the be-all end-all credibility but if a group like ours that is very concerned about spending money was to give our blessing on the basis that it would actually save money in the long run i think 
think that would actually help uh, give credibility to the process. And we'd be willing to do that if the cost was reasonable and there was buy-in, because the last thing we want to see is another 50 years of this money going down the drain. Yeah, and for Trudeau, there's a great opportunity here to say, look, even if I win a second term, no matter what, I will not move into 24 Sussex Drive. That's my contribution, so I don't have skin in the game here. Uh, and I think that for him and his family, they're at Rideau Cottage. It seems to be working, as you've said. That would be a way for him to say, that, look, no matter what, I, I'm out of this. This isn't my home. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I mean, again, I, I just I find it very curious that he uh, and others have said, oh, well, you know, the, the public outrage about about spending. I mean, where where is this concern on just about anything <laughs> else? I mean, I, I would love to see that concern shown somewhere else. And then, you know, we'd be happy to cut a little slack on the House if he would just rein in these ridiculous deficits that he promised he wouldn't run. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the symbolism is important here, because it's it's the symbolism of spending the money, but he's okay with the actual practice of spending it on yes, everything else. Exactly, exactly. Well, it was a great column by Aaron Woodrick of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation in the Toronto Sun. Time to tear down 24 Sussex. Aaron, thanks for your time, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, Andrew.